One ever feels his Tunis, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals and one black body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. The history of the American Negro is a history of this strife, this longing to attain self-conscious manhood to merge his double self into a better and truer self. In this merging, he wishes neither of the older selves to be lost. He would not Africanize America, for America has too much to teach the world and Africa. He would not bleach his Negro soul in a flood of white Americanism, for he knows that Negro blood has a message for the world. He simply wishes to make it possible for a man to be both a Negro and an American, without being cursed and spit upon by his fellows, without having the doors of opportunity closed roughly in his face. Those were the words of W.E.B. Du Bois, writing about opportunity in 1903. His words sum up the history of black Americans to this day. The simple wish to be both a Negro and an American. For generations, America's black leaders have talked and walked many roads to make that wish come true. Some said economic independence was the way. Others fought for social equality. Some said, convince the white man he's wrong and he'll help us to make up for lost time. Others said, pick up your weapons and fight. And a few said, it will never happen. The black man will never be allowed to be an American. Let's pack our bags and leave. No one black man spoke to or for all black men. Different messages reached different ears. To understand the black voices of today, we must listen to the black voices of yesterday. Here are the voices of some of the black Americans who led their people in the 19th century and helped to shape black thought in the 20th century. Way over in Egypt's land, you shall gain the victory. Way over in Egypt's land, brother, you go to gain the day. Before the abolition movement took hold in the 1830s, black organizations and newspapers worked not only to free the slaves, but to gain equality for free blacks in the North. The first black newspaper in America appeared in 1827. Called Freedom's Journal, it was founded by Samuel Cornish and John Russworm, the first black graduate of Bedoin College. In the first issue, they told their black readers that blacks must speak for themselves. We wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. Too long have the public been deceived by misrepresentations and things which concern us dearly. For though there are many in society who exercise towards us benevolent feelings, still there are others who make it their business to enlarge upon the least trifle which tends to the discredit of any person of color and denounce our whole body for the misconduct of this guilty one. Cornish and Russ Worm urged free blacks to make use of their votes an early call to black power at the ballot box. At the same time, a free black named David Walker called for a more militant, aggressive stand by blacks. In 1829, Walker published a pamphlet demanding the overthrow of slavery by force and violence. The pamphlet, entitled An Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World, was a hard-hitting call to battle. Walker attacked the white man's myth that slavery was good for the black man. He knew that deep down the white man felt guilt, and guilt made him fear the black man. The whites know well if we are men, and there is a secret monitor in their hearts which tell them we are. 
They know, I say, if we are men and see them treating us in the manner they do, that there can be nothing in our hearts but death alone for them. Never make an attempt to gain our freedom or natural right from under our cruel oppressors and murderers until you see your way clear. When that hour arrives and you move, be not afraid or dismayed. If you commence, make sure work. Do not trifle, for they will not trifle with you. They want us for their slaves and think nothing of murdering us in order to subject us to that wretched condition. Therefore, if there is an attempt made by us, kill or be killed. Two years after Walker published his appeal on August 21st, 1831, a slave named Nat Turner led the bloodiest slave revolt in America's history. Turner said his revolt had been inspired by a vision from God. About this time, I had a vision, and I saw white spirits and black spirits engaged in battle, and the sun was darkened, and the thunder rolled in the heavens, and blood flowed in streams, and I heard a voice saying, Such is your luck, such your call to see, and let it come rough or smooth, you must surely bear it. And on May 12th, 1828, I heard a loud noise in the heavens, and the spirit instantly appeared to me, and said the serpent was loosened, and Christ had laid down the yoke he had borne for the sins of man, and that I should take it on and fight against the serpent. But a time was fast approaching when the first should be last, and the last should be first. Nat Turner and his followers set out on what Turner called their work of death. Turner's master and his family were the first victims. The massacre terrified Southerners. Sixty white men, women, and children were killed by Turner's men. At least 100 blacks were killed in putting down the revolt. The South reacted by tightening its hand on the slaves. Harsher slave codes, more slave patrols, larger state militias. One morning soon, one morning soon, my lord, one morning soon, I heard the angels sing. Turner's revolt brought the question of armed resistance out into the open. Black anti-slavery leaders disagreed with each other on the issue. Some, like the Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, favored slave revolts as the way to freedom. Garnett was a former slave who became a militant abolitionist. At a black convention in 1843, he called for the slaves to take up arms. Brethren, the time has come when you must act for yourselves. You had far better die, die immediately, than live as slaves and entrail your wretchedness upon your posterity. If you would be free, here is your only hope. However much you and all of us may desire it, there is not much hope of redemption without the shedding of blood. If you must bleed, let it all come at once. Brethren, arise, arise, strike for your lives and liberty. Now is the day and the hour. Let every slave throughout the land do this, and the days of slavery are numbered. Rather die freedmen than live to be slaves. Remember that you are four million. Garnett wanted the convention to adopt slave revolts as the official policy of black leaders. After a long debate, the black convention turned down Garnett's appeal by one vote. Leading the blacks who thought Garnett too extreme was another famous abolitionist, Frederick Douglass, a runaway slave Douglas was to become the leader of the black abolitionist movement. Unlike Garnett, he did not counsel violence as the only way to win the struggle. The whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her august claims have been born of earnest struggle. If there is not struggle, there is no progress. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. 
Douglas's most powerful weapon in the struggle against slavery was his newspaper, The North Star, named after the star that runaway blacks followed in their flight north from slavery. The first issue of the paper came out on December 3rd, 1847. Douglas declared his beliefs in his opening editorial. Douglas, a free black, called for the unity of all blacks, free and slave, in the fight against slavery. Remember that we are one, that our cause is one, and that we must help each other if we would succeed. We are one with you under the ban of prejudice and proscription. One with you under the slander of inferiority. One with you in social and political disfranchisement. What you suffer, we suffer. What you endure, we endure. We are indissolubly united and must fall or flourish together. The Civil War was fought and won. It settled forever the legal question of slavery in America. But blacks soon found that freedom from slavery did not mean equality. That battle was not over. It had just begun. As black leaders had tried different paths to abolition, they now tried different routes to equality. Blanche Bruce was one of two black U.S. senators during Reconstruction, the period following the Civil War. In battling for civil rights, Bruce showed great tolerance to those whites who were trying to hold the black man down. We simply demand the practical recognition of the rights given us in the Constitution and laws and ask from our white fellow citizens only the consideration and fairness that we so willingly extend to them. Let them generally realize and concede that citizenship imports to us what it does to them, no more and no less. Francis L. Cardoza was another famous black reconstruction leader. Born free, he was educated in Europe and returned to America to become Secretary of State in South Carolina. He was one of the most brilliant men of his time. He argued that land and only land would make the black man truly free. We will never have true freedom until we abolish the system of agriculture which existed in the southern states. Give the planters an opportunity, breathing time, and they will reorganize the same old system that they had before the war. I say then, now is the time to strike. Land was not the only issue during Reconstruction. Southern state governments had been forced to give the black man the right to vote. But what the governments gave with one hand, they took away with the other. Black Bishop Henry McNeil Turner was elected to the first Reconstruction legislature in Georgia. The legislature expelled all its black members in September 1868. Bishop Turner spoke out against the move. Do we ask you for compensation for the sweat our fathers bore you, for the tears you have caused, the hearts you have broken, and the lives you have curtailed, and the blood you have spilled? Do we ask retaliation? We ask it not. We are willing to let the dead pass, bury its dead. But we ask you now for our rights. You may expel us, gentlemen, but I firmly believe that you will someday repent it. The black man cannot protect the country if the country doesn't protect him. And if tomorrow a war should arise, I would not raise a musket to defend the country where my manhood is denied. I will say to the colored man of Georgia, never lift a finger nor raise a hand in defense of Georgia unless Georgia acknowledges that you are men and invests you with the rights pertaining to manhood. Turner fought for the rights of the poor, white and black. But when the blacks were expelled from Georgia's legislature, he grew bitter toward the white world and decided that there was no hope for the black man in America. 
Turner became active in the Back to Africa movement and hoped to settle some half million American blacks in Liberia. Most blacks opposed the idea of returning to Africa. They had helped build America and were determined to win their freedom. They knew that they were in for a hard fight. White supremacists and the South refused to obey the civil rights laws passed during Reconstruction. Militant blacks said that Southerners would not listen to reason, that blacks must meet force with force. Such a man was a black journalist named John Bruce. In 1889, Bruce wrote this plea for organized black resistance. Under the present condition of affairs, the only hope the only salvation for the Negro is to be found in a resort to force under wise and discreet leaders. He must sooner or later come to this in order to set at rest for all time to come the charge that he is a moral coward. Let the Negro require at the hands of every white murderer in the South or elsewhere a life for a life. If they burn our houses, burn theirs. If they kill our wives and children, kill theirs pursue them relentlessly, meet force with force everywhere it's offered. If they demand blood, exchange with them until they are satiated. Organized resistance to organized resistance is the best remedy for the solution of the vexed problem of the century. At the end of the 19th century, a bright, forceful black spokesman took a position that many thought was a half step toward total equality. The man was Booker T. Washington, one of the most influential Americans, white or black, of his time. Southern whites accepted Washington's philosophy of education and self-help for black people. They invited Washington to speak at an exposition in Atlanta, Georgia, on September 18, 1895. Washington's address established him as a national leader. Washington believed that black economic independence would have to come before social and political equality. The wisest among my race understand that the agitation of questions of social equality is the extremist folly and that progress in the enjoyment of all the privileges that will come to us must be the result of severe and constant struggle rather than of artificial forcing. It is important and right that all privileges of the law be ours, but it is vastly more important that we be prepared for the exercises of these privileges. The opportunity to earn a dollar in a factory just now is worth infinitely more than the opportunity to spend a dollar in an opera house. Booker T. Washington stressed hard work and thrift for his people. He thought that the children of slaves would have to learn to work with their hands to improve their lives and earn the respect of the white world. He told his followers, there is little race prejudice in the American dollar. Washington's thinking was applauded by whites in the North as well as the South. They looked to him as the leader of America's blacks and made him one of the most powerful men of his day. But many blacks strongly disagreed with Washington. Such a man was John Hope, a Southern educator who became the first black president of Atlanta Baptist College. If we are not striving for equality, in heaven's name, for what are we living? I regard it as cowardly and dishonest for any of our colored men to tell white people or colored people that we are not struggling for equality. Let us not fool ourselves nor be fooled by others. If we cannot do what other free men do, then we are not free. Never say let well enough alone. Be discontented. Be dissatisfied. Let your discontent break mountain high against the wall of prejudice and swamp it. Then we shall not have to plead for justice, nor on bended knee crave mercy, for we shall be men. Black leaders in the 19th century took different stands on almost every important issue. Abolition. Colonization. Cooperation. Armed resistance. Land. Votes. Jobs and money. Social equality 
as the century ended, the voice of Booker T. Washington seemed to be the loudest and the clearest. It was the one black voice that white America listened to. But other black voices were emerging that spoke less gently to the white man. 20th century black leaders looked back on the hard-won gains of the 19th century and knew that their battle for freedom had only just begun. Thank you.